Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21, and this is one of the many webinars we do where we, in where we interview interesting people or look at important issues. And today we're going to look at local government. Now, one of the problems with local government that lots of people find when they look at it, when they visit it or when they watch it online, is it looks like sort of a, a chaotic uh, chamber of, of bickering and party infighting. And people often, um, you know, debate small issues, get hot under the collar about it and miss the big issues. And we, one of the persons who faced that was Jackie Weaver in Hamforth Parish Council. And we've got Jackie with us today, who's going to talk about that and civility in local government. So Jackie, you know, welcome, um, welcome to in joining us today. And it's great that you, you're able to be here. So maybe we could start, can I ask you, I mean, you know, you, you became famous in, in that Hanford Paris Council um, streamed video, but you must have had a life before that. Tell us, <laughs> you know, tell us a bit about your life before Hanforth. And, and uh, thank you, Francis. And I hope I have a life after Hanforth as well. Um, yeah, I, I've been um, the chief officer of the Cheshire Association of Local Councils for um, the best part of um, the century. I like to say it that way because it sounds an awful lot longer than 25 years, doesn't it? Um, and the way we're set up, we're an organisation that provides support, advice, training, guidance to town and parish councils, which was why. I was there that evening at Hanforth. And believe it or not, there are more Jackie Weavers out there. There's one in every Shire County. Um, and between us, we make up a network that is affiliated to the National Association of Local Councils, which is a little bit like the LGA. So, so, you, so you had a life in local government, really. But when you um, shot to fame during the famous meeting that we all now know about, um, I mean, shot to fame nationally and globally, that actually surprise you? It surprised the heck out of me. <laughs> uh, I mean, my first thought was, oh my goodness, what have I missed? Because please don't forget, this went viral at the second week in February, first, second week in February. But the meeting itself took place the year before. The meeting took place in December. So, you know, the rest of us had all moved on, Hanforth had moved on. So, so for us, it was really kind of um, old news. But with such excitement around it, you couldn't help but think, did I miss something? Well, um, you, you certainly did shoot to fame and you've used that fame very creatively now and, and you're using it to fight for civility in local government. Now, why have you chosen to do that? Well, I, I mean, it's, I'd like to say um, that Handforth had been my, my one and only experience of a challenging council. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important to just first of all put out there that actually most of our councils, most of our councillors are just fabulous. I mean, you know, councillors are literally an army of unpaid volunteers that do a fantastic job for their, their locality, usually. But across the country, there are sometimes councils that face real challenges because of one or two difficult members and because of the way we're set because of the lack of sanctions, that's my opinion, um, because the lack of um, formal oversight, if you will, by town and parish councils, that they're not, um, for example, subject to the scrutiny of the local government ombudsman. So these few individuals are able to make a disproportionate effect on our local communities. And it's just not right. The answer can't be, if you see somebody behaving really badly, well, just put up with it for the next four years and then you can get rid of them. That's you wouldn't say that in the workplace, would you? No, you wouldn't. But I mean, you say councillors do a wonderful job, and clearly many, many do. But you know, there have been a number of councils where there's been examples of of a, a lot of quarrelling, a lot of bitterness of of people being having the wit withdrawn for the smallest matter. Um, so it's not. I mean, Handforth isn't entirely atypical, is it? It does happen elsewhere. It does happen elsewhere, um, and I try not to to minimise um, the effect that it, that it has. I think it's also perhaps helpful to make a distinction, and we often don't make a distinction, between our principal authorities, that's our county councils and our borough councils, 
and town and parish councils. You mentioned there about the whip being removed. Now, the whip being removed from a politician is a serious sanction. I, I mean, you know, being, say, serious sanction. It doesn't apply at town and parish council level because we don't have party politics. Well, I was going to ask you that, and, and it's interesting because you sort of answered it, and I was going to say, is it party politics that makes this happen? But clearly from your experience, it's not. It's something else. What is it? Um, I, I mean, in fact, if there is, uh, sometimes our parishes and towns, particular towns, do have an informal party structure. It can only be informal because there's no legislative um, backup for it. And in that instance, you have at least got some mechanism to work with, you know, through the party, if you will. Um, but what is it with town and parish councils? I think it's the, the very local nature of them. I mean, sometimes these arguments don't just go back for a generation, they go back to the previous generation. You know, that they're often in tight knit communities um, where passions do run high about things that outside of that community we probably just wouldn't get it so, so you're saying are you that they bring personal disputes that they have outside often into the council chamber yeah i i think so and, and sometimes it, it'll be when i say personal dispute it may not be i don't like you um it may be i don't like your position on you know whether or not we develop the playing field um but again because they are they live cheek by jowl you know, the area is the geographic area of the town or parish. These are neighbours, and you know what neighbour disputes can be like. Yes, neighbours can be a problem. But, um, I mean, you've obviously decided you want to do something about it, and you've set up a petition. Can you tell us about that petition? Yeah, uh, two things. Um, I mean, one, um, I, was, um, I came across um, a, an organisation called Compassion in Politics, um, and they asked me if I would like to be um, one of their ambassadors. Um, and I thought, well, that really sits comfortably with, with what I have been talking about, um, but not just since February. I mean, it's something that I felt for a long, long time. Um, and the petition, again, those of us who've worked with town and parish councils feel very keenly the frustration of not having sanctions in place to deal with really bad behavior and the petition is calling for government to look at this again i mean they've been asked over and over again I mean, since the localism act 2011 um the code of conduct really had all its teeth removed um and you know sometimes that the kind of person um, that will abuse the system is the kind of person who really feels it's a badge of honor to get away with it so the petition it's calling for the introduction of sanctions for poor behaviour. Sanctions when people breach the code of conduct. Um, now, for some people who don't know, and there will be many people who don't know, what is a code of conduct? Um, the code of conduct um, for local councils was introduced, oh gosh, I can't even remember when it was. It was revisited in 2011. Um, and it was introduced when um, the government felt that there was um, examples of poor behaviour and invited uh, no one to come and look at whether or not there was an issue here. Um, so it started with central government um, and um, Nolan developed what we call the seven Nolan principles. Um, and to be honest, they're really what you would expect from a human being. We're not talking about some kind of higher power here that you know we're going to hold our councillors to. It's things like transparency, honesty, openness, you know, um, not bullying. I can't remember what the phrase is for that. Compassion. I mean, surely these are the kind of things that you would expect from your elected representatives without it having to be written down in the code. Well, I've seen many leaders of councils, well, not many, I've seen some leaders of councils, uh, you know, be uh, engage in bad behaviour, whilst at the same time saying they're observing the Nolan principles, uh, which often which often happens. Um, I mean, you, you, you talk about um, sanctions in the sense that if people breach the code of conduct, 
they then are released from their position. Um, now, is that for every breach of the code of conduct or is it for serious? And what do you mean? How do you define that? Oh, I, I, I think you have, uh, well, first of all, we have a, a system in place where the monitoring officer of the borough or county council investigates, and, and that seems to work perfectly well. But you see the outcome of the uh, investigation. And at the moment, even for the most serious breach, and we're possibly talking about um, bullying of staff, abusive behavior on um, social media, you know, um, calling for um, the staff to be sacked because they're incompetent, you know, real abusive stuff that's being shared with the world. And their sanction is to be removed from committees. So it, it, it's serious like that. I mean, for example, in one council locally, um, a leader was found in breach of the code of conduct because of bullying on one occasion. Yes. And on another occasion, that leader was found in breach of, uh, uh, of the code of conduct because they were trying to influence the scrutiny committee, which should be independent of the executive. Right. Is that the sort of thing you mean? Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, I totally understand the point that other people make, which is about Yes, but they may not be perfect, but you elected them. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that they should be stripped of office permanently, but they certainly should be given, was it um, um, one of the uh, TV characters called um, Time Out on the Naughty Step to, um, to reconsider um, their actions. There has to be some meaningful sanction. Sounds and we can't like use the stocks anymore. That, that's yeah. just too controversial. No, I won't use the stocks. The social network that I'm involved in, we have a thing called a step of woe, that if people, you know, breach the, the conduct that they, we consider to be reasonable and civil, then they go on a step of woe for two, three, four or five days. Um, so, so basically, you're not asking, for example, if a leader were to breach the code of conduct, you're not asking for them to be um, expelled from the council, but maybe not to hold the position they're holding. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so, so that's important. But one problem, though, is who makes the decision about the breach of the code of conduct. Okay, the govern, governing officer makes a recommendation, but the investigation is often done by a committee. Now, that committee could be independent, or it could be made up of councillors of which a majority supports someone who's behaved in bad, with bad behaviour. How do you ensure that the investigating group of a councillor who is charged with breach of conduct is fairly dealt with? I can only speak from my own experience, um, but certainly here in Cheshire, um, they will, uh, the principal authority will in fact appoint an independent investigator. Uh, that's in, I mean, that's interesting because, um, I mean, in again, the council I know of, they had a committee with an independent lawyer on, found against the leader who afterwards with her cabinet got rid of the independent lawyer so it almost became I suppose some people would think the kangaroo court so yeah. should that investigation be done outside of the councillors you should bring someone independent in to do it as I say certainly here in Cheshire for major breaches that is what they do you say major breaches uh what about other minor breaches? Is that dealt with internally? And... That would be dealt with internally. And don't forget, they, in my perspective, is they have also got responsibility for um, 164 parish councils in each borough. So they're also the investigating body for the town and parish councils for their sins. So is, is that set up as a permanent body for investigation or is it you know, got together ad hoc case by case? Mm -hmm. No, it, it's a standing committee. And who would be on that standing committee? Um, I, in truth, I don't know, Francis. Um, it will be a cross-party mix. Um, for, and also a cross-council mix? Uh, no. No, the regulations um, previous, uh, prior to 2011, I do sound terribly stuck in the past now, don't I? Um, in the good old days, seriously, they weren't. Um, then we had, um, each council had to have two parish representatives. 2011 removed the need for two parish representatives 
and replaced it with one independent person. But the principle that you would recommend in every case is it that the investigating committee should have independence. It shouldn't be a, a committee that could be influenced by the leader or the cabinet or a faction. Yeah, and, and again, you know, I mean, influencing decisions like that is surely a breach of the code. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing is, you know, it's an interesting point you raised there, Francis, and I'd, I'd totally forgotten about it, um, is that, of course, since the borough council has such responsibility for all its parishes it does seem a backward step not to be consulting with someone who actually comes from the town and parish council because as you can tell from february a lot of people still don't understand how town and parish councils operate i i, I think that's particularly true in, in places where i live like london that don't have them though there are moves to impose sort of neighborhood councils and not impose but have, have... You have got parish councils in london do we yeah i, I thought they were called neighborhood councils same difference they're allowed so... to call themselves um neighborhood council county um, community council whatever they want but yes we are slowly colonizing even london yeah, I know they're called community councils, but I guess they're based on the, the parish council idea. And um, it's it's good to know that you are colonising London. Because, not, me, not me personally, you understand. Yeah, but. No, but the, 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 the parish movement. Um, I mean, how important is it local government does have that sort of community parish element to it, which is so close to the community? It can cause that bickering and personal things you said, but it also has some tremendous advantages as well doesn't it? I, I mean, personally, I, I, I would expect it. I think it's essential. I mean, in, in Cheshire, for example, again, where I have my experience, um, nine years ago, we were a three tier authority. So we had a county council, we had six district councils, and um, 234 parish councils. Now we've moved to a unitary authority. So we have a Cheshire East and a Cheshire West and the parish councils. So how you get that local voice into Cheshire East and Cheshire West at a time when government funding is being reduced year on year, so that the principal authorities themselves are contracting um, and only really dealing with the statutory functions, then who else is going to pick up the slack if not your town and parish councils? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very good point because uh, it's certainly in London, councils, councils can often feel very remote from individuals and being, being able to engage is, is difficult. But, but going back to this issue about bad behaviour and bickering, for example, uh, you want structural changes in, in making sure that people are um, sanctioned if they that they engage in bad behaviour. But is there a cultural problem as well that we have to face that, uh, you know, people in councils very often don't know how to engage with each other in a proper deliberative way? Um, I, I'm not sure that that's true. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes when you look at the um, the challenging councillors, um, if you look at their day job, they cope with that perfectly. You know, it, it's almost as if they, they, there is a lack of accountability when they sit as a councillor. So that, you know, in the day job, as I would call it, um, there is a structure there, there are penalties for poor behaviour. If nothing else, you might get sacked. Um, but when you're sitting as a councillor, it, it feels quite different. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's quite interesting because, I mean, you're arguing that one of the ways of regressing the problems is having a better system of accountability. And, and that clearly is true. But when you look at councils and, and the way they meet, in the council chamber, accountability is not very strong. In the debating chamber, people come with prepared speeches uh, and they're not you know, addressing the arguments very well. They're sort of grandstanding, partly because they don't have experience, partly because they're nervous, because, partly because that's the way they do things. How can we create a more deliberative chamber? I mean, parish councils 
probably could set an example on that because they must talk in a much more cross-party friendly way, except for a handful for us, of course. Um, uh, 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 and when you have big councils like you do in London, then set pieces take over. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I've listened to, to one or two during um, you know, quiet moments from the telly um, at, uh, in Cheshire. And I, I think they are completely um, disengaging. Um, I mean, not least of which is you start with um, the um, the meeting pack, which might run to 350 pages. You know, and then you think, well, there's something I'm particularly interested in here. Where is it? Oh, that would be on page 349. And of course, you stopped listening. You stopped even reading it. Page 340. Um, so I, I think there's a challenge there about how we present information. But certainly at local, my local council level, I think we see far more, far more debate. And I guess that's one of the reasons I feel so strongly about Zoom or the platforms are available being removed from us. That is such a backward step because I think we were beginning to see better engagement by the community. I think your point, you know, you mentioned um, the council chamber. Council chambers, even in modern buildings, are quite intimidating places. You know, in a modern building, it feels like you've got to get through three levels of security and God help you if you lose the badge. Um, and then, you know, in the, in the old town hall, it kind of feels, you know, quite intimidating that that sort of large, um, you know, oak panel building with, um, you know, kind of um, stained glass windows with a list of all the aldermen, etc. Quite imposing. And then you've got to walk in there and you know, feel that you are part of this meeting when you don't even know where to sit. You know, it's even worse sometimes than feeling that you're going to church because you always sit in the room. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, vi uh, virtual meetings have given people the opportunity literally to just peep in. And I think that we should build on that, except that we can't build on that because we no longer have the power to hold virtual meetings. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's a shame. But how would you build on it if you could? Because a lot of those virtual meetings almost become or organised like a PR exercise where there's not engagement from people from outside. Um, you can't see the comments that are coming up. Um, and, and you just get a continual number of speeches by by people that can sometimes be as bad as a council meeting, but it has the potential to be better. How would you, you know, carry that potential forward to make it more engaging? I, I think, first of all, we, we have to teach people, we have to show people that these local councils are a resource. You know, get involved. I mean, that, that's something that I said many times over the last three or four months. Um, is that, you know, it, it's all very well saying, well, my council's not worth bothering with. Well, get out there and change it. You know, if, if there's something that you're trying to achieve in your community, a local council is a tremendous tool for doing that with, but it needs people to operate it. And why should that not be you? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's true. I mean, the idea of a councillor being a leader in their community and linking with the council is a really powerful thing. But some councils don't let their councillors be leaders in their community community because they really control them heavily by a party whip so they don't feel free to speak. How can you free councillors so that they can, you know, uh, sort of organise their creative capabilities with their community? I, again, I, I come back to town and parish councils. I think that's where we start. I think that's where we build confidence in ourselves and then look at perhaps moving up the chain a bit. Yeah, OK. And another thing about meetings, which is interesting, and particularly in your case, is you came over when you did that amazing, um, that when you were in that amazing meeting, as a very firm chair person um, with this power to switch people off, which is rather nice. It's a nice power to have when you're on social media. How important is the chair in meetings? Because I've seen meetings, scrutiny meetings, which where the chair has not been very firm and has not been very good and really hasn't been able to run the meeting effectively as possible. Chairing a meeting is quite a skill, isn't it? It, it, it is. I have to correct you there, though, Francis. I wasn't actually chairing the meeting. All I was doing was facilitating the meeting so they could elect a chairman, although it didn't necessarily go the way it was <laughs> going to go. 
Um, I think you're absolutely right. Chairmanship is a skill. We do training in chairmanship. We won't be the only county association or the only organisation um, that, that trains people how to be chairman. And it isn't enough to pitch up and sit in the seat at the front. You yeah. really do have to work at being an effective chairman. And that includes working behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you about training because you, you, it's interesting you said you weren't a chair, you were a facilitator, but a good chair actually is a facilitator, aren't they? I mean, they, they work behind the scenes, they try to look at the agenda, they try to involve people. You shouldn't go into a meeting cold, should you? Oh, absolutely not. Um, and, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, I mean, certainly um, I still do my day job. Um, so I still deal with queries and concerns that our parishes raise for us. And sometimes, you know, when something has gone wrong in a meeting, you know, you're, you're left thinking, why didn't the chairman just stop it? You know, you've got a member swearing at you. Why are you even listening to them? You know? Yeah, I know. Um, but many chair persons find that difficult to do. And I, I mean, can you, can anyone be a chairperson or is that a special aptitude and you've got to find the people who are good at doing that? I think that's a really good question, Francis. And I think sometimes um, people are appointed chairman um, because it's their turn, um, because they don't want the other chap or the other woman um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, the last one being actually, I think they make a good chairman. And, and often they are selected because they are supporting the, you know, the, the ruling party and they don't give any, think, any thought to the chairmanship skills. Yeah. They just want someone who follows the line. Um, is there any way out of that? I mean, is there any way in which we can encourage more independent type of chairmanship? Um. One of the things that's, that's come up recently, and again, um, town and parish council sector, um, is, a, is a move to try and separate the role of chairman from the, from the civic role. And I think that has some merit. So, for example, in a town council, we'll have a mayor. So the chairman refers to themselves as mayor. And you remember, you know, you'll have the chain, you sometimes have the, the, red, the red robes, etc. Very ceremonial. Um, and the mayor will spend a lot of their time during the year um, shaking hands. You know, it, it's their role to go out and represent the council and be photographed with a chain, handing over you know, checks to community groups, etc. But the kind of person who really enjoys doing that is probably not the kind of person who is an efficient leader in a, bit, in a modern council, wanting to get business done. So, you know, there is a there's a movement there about whether or not those two roles should be separated. And I, I have some sympathy for that position. And you say there's a movement. How big a movement is there and where is that coming from? I mean, we certainly at our last um, annual meeting, we hold an annual meeting in Cheshire in October. Um, and it was certainly one of the uh, motions put forward by council. Um, and I know that in some town councils, have informal working relationships where they have a leader. It can't be formalised because there's no legislative backup for it. Um, but they have that kind of, I think the way we do it is we, we look at the leader as being the um, policy chairman. So, I mean, do you know of any councils apart from local ones who do have chair people of, uh, of that kind? I mean, having the mayor there is a bit like nationally asking the queen to, to, to chair meetings. I mean, do you know, do you know any councils that have looked carefully at the chairmanship of their organisation and are trying to find people who can do the job rather than people who hold the, hold the position? Only at local level. I, I, I can't speak for the principal authority on that. And again, the principal authority does seem to be um, there are other criteria. Okay, well, that's something I think maybe we could explore in the future because it's a really good idea to actually look at chairmanship and see how, you know, they can be trained up. And it's really interesting to know that you do training um, and how they can be trained up to do a job 
which actually facilitates a meeting and not just sits there and takes advice from the governance officer because they don't know what to do. Um, so that's good. I mean, we're getting close to the end of, of this now. Half an hour always goes very, very quickly. Um, you obviously uh, have been faced with banality in, in local government. You, you think local government isn't all like that, but it is. But you are, aren't you, a strong believer in the importance of local government? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have spent 25 years um, working there if I thought they were a waste of time. Um, no, I, I think they're hugely important for their local communities. I mean, I, I guess that's one of the things that I try to kind of get across when I'm uh, talking about them is that you will never see the joy of them as you look in from outside unless you are looking at your own because they are only interest. I mean, the Handforth meeting, for example, when you know we duly elected a chairman and went on to conduct parish council business, um, nobody would have sat through the rest of that. It, it was just not entertaining. We're talking about um, parking spaces at the um, the railway station. We were talking about the neighbourhood plan, the local plan. You know, anybody who's not familiar with hand four on this fine it just no you just wouldn't be interested at all what's this what we'll know quickly get a telly on but in your own community as i said before if you can see it as a tool for achieving something that you want to achieve in your parish or town council it has value okay well thank you for for, for talking about that because i think your experience is, is really valuable and i think people can learn a lot from it and we talked about a number of issues which i think are important in their discussions i think which will go on and on in local government and and you know your role in local government has been important and you've expressed the view that local government itself is valuable it does link if it's organized the right way the community with decision makers so you know thank you for for doing this interview with us it's been really interesting and we'll uh, finish this interview now <laughs>